All right, I'd like to welcome everyone to Ironside Lunch and Learn. This week's parasha is Parashat Emor. It's the continuation of the Torah Kohanim. We've been talking about it for the past few weeks. This is constantly talking about the Mishkan, the, the Kohanim, their jobs, what they wear, what they do. And this, you know, their restrictions, their guidelines. And this week is a continuation of that. This week, Parashat Demor talks about who they're allowed to marry. They talk about many other things, but I'm just going to focus in on that. It says that a, a Kohen needs to go with a specific kind of girl. She needs to be a Betula. She also cannot be a divorcee. She cannot be a widow. And uh, and you have to know that these are halachot that are held today as well. Kohanim are still Kohanim to, to a certain regard. They might not be uh, working in Bet HaMikdash bringing korbanot, but there are certain laws that they follow that are different from ours. Kohanim are very special. I want to tell you a story of a certain Kohen from Yerushalayim. I think I repeated this story maybe three times this week. No, I'm sorry. I already repeated it once this week, but it's so nice I had to say it twice. It's going to be my second time. So, there's a story of a, of a Kohen in Yerushalayim that was married. And he had a great marriage. Everything was going great. Him and his, and his wife loved each other. But they had one problem. They couldn't bear children for a very long time, close to 10 years. Now, halakhically, if you get to the point where you're married and you can't have, bear, you can't have children for 10 years, you can, there's a halakha that you can divorce your wife. Because the mitzvah, which is the first mitzvah in the Torah, it's a man's obligation. So these were God-fearing Jews, followed the halakha to the team. And when it came to the 10-year mark, the wife tells the husband, it's not working out, I love you, you love me, but we're not having children. I think you have to divorce me. He's telling him, no, never, I love you so much. How can you ask me to do that? It's like, it's not me. It's the halakha. They go ask the rabbi. The rabbi tells them it's true. It is the halakha. You have the obligation of, be, of uh, procreating. And the halakha is that after 10 years, you do have the right to get a divorce. And the, you can imagine the wife, she's such a tzaddikah, she told them, go, perform the halakha, perform the mitzvah. You must. As a God-fearing Jew, you must. Wow. Come to the, you know, if you think of it, it's unbelievable. They go through with it. They go through a divorce. And wouldn't you know it, three months later, she starts to show. Hmm. She's pregnant. She can't believe it. He can't believe it. They go back to the rabbi. Rabbi, what do we do? She's pregnant. I want to marry my wife. He goes to her, you can't. You're a Kohen. You can't marry a divorcee even if she's your own wife. But he's like, Rabbi, you know our story. Ten years we're trying to have children. I love her. My baby's in her belly. Isn't there a hetel? Isn't there something that you can come up with? I want to get back to my wife. I want to get back to my family. The Rabbi tells them the halakha is the halakha. You cannot change anything. You as a Kohen cannot go back to your ex-wife, even if she's pregnant. The man is crushed by this news. You could imagine. You could imagine how he's feeling. And he just doesn't know what to do. The rabbi suggested he go visit his father in Brooklyn. He says, listen, you're going through a lot. It's very traumatic. Take some time off. Visit your father in the States. And come back, maybe you'll have a different outlook, a different attitude, maybe things will be better, Rezabashim. 
The guy takes the rabbi's advice, he goes all the way to Brooklyn. At that time his father wasn't feeling well, he was in the hospital. And he goes and he visits him in the hospital. And he, he catches him up. He goes, I'm dead. I'm not going to believe this, but you know, we followed the halakha to the T. We got the divorce, and now she's pregnant, and I just don't know what to do. I just don't know what to do. What should I do? So his father tells him, have a seat, son. I have, some, I have something to tell you. He tells him, go back to your wife, and go back to your child. Go back and marry her, because the truth is, you're not a Kohen. When you were a baby, we actually adopted you. And this whole time, we didn't know when was the right time to tell you. But right now, it's actually the best time to tell you that you can go back to your wife and go back and marry again and, and start your family. And he was so happy and he went back and the story is a happy ending. Now if you look back at the story, I see so many things. One, Hashem works in such mysterious ways that you'll never know. However, this person's emuna, his ironclad faith in Hashem, no questions, the halakha is the halakha. Whatever I'm supposed to do is what I'm supposed to do. Even if it goes against all my emotions, what a Jew. What a Jew. I'm thinking that most people say, hey, I don't care about being a Kohen. I want my wife and the baby I've been fighting for for 10 years. Could have chose that route. No? What did he do? He went through with it. If this is what Hashem wants me to do, if this is the halakha, I'm going with it. I'm thinking about that guy and I tip my hat off to him. Who can do that? Bypassing your emotions, and these are strong emotions. To be a Jew that's walking the, the straight and narrow in Hashem's eyes. Eved Hashem. That's real and That's an unbelievable Jew with unbelievable Jewish standards. Something to look up to. But it's also a very emotional story. Every time I repeat it, I think about it. And here's a guy that lives and abides by the rules of the Torah. And eventually, no matter how it looked, whatever point in life, eventually worked itself out. He had enough emunah, enough faith that eventually things are for the best. And every move that he did was exactly that, knowing that everything that he does, the kol etova, if I'm not going to be with her, if I'm not going to, if I'm not going to be married to her, he accepted it because he knew that's what Hashem wanted. Every moment is custom made for your life. Very, very interesting story about one kohen from Yerushalayim. At the end of the parasha. The, the rest of the parasha talks a lot about the holidays. It talks about the different holidays and uh, <coughs> and what we're supposed to do in them. And then uh, at the end of the parasha, something very, very interesting. I'll read it to you. I'll read it in Hebrew and then I'll explain it. It says, Vayitzev ben eshet Yisraelit, vahu ben ish mitzri betoch ben Yisrael, vayinotu b'machane ben Yisraelit be'ish Yisraelit, what does it mean? Basically, there was a son of a Jewish lady, of an Israelite, who was also the son of an Egyptian that was in the midst of Am Yisrael, and he wanted to set up camp with the Jewish people, and they didn't let him, so he cursed Hashem. They brought him in front of Moshe. They quarantined him and put him in front of Moshe. And his mom's name is Shulamit ben Divri from the Shevet Dan. Well, here's an interesting story. We have to go back to Egypt in order to get the beginning of the story. So we have now an individual that's in the desert. In the desert, all the Jewish people were in tribes. Everyone had a section, flag and a section. Comes this one guy who's half Jewish on the mom's side and half Egyptian, and he wants to set up camp. He's like, I just did Yetziat Mitzrayim. I also, uh, where do I live? Where do I stay? So he says, my mom is from Shevet Dan, 
Let me set up camp with Shem and, and Shem and Dan says, no, not here. You cannot. Why? Because you can only sit with the tribe where your father is from. And his father is Egyptian. It doesn't go by the way of, uh, of the mothers. The same thing when you inherit the land. You can only inherit the land according to the tribe of your father. Later on, by the way, there's a story of the, of the daughters of Menashe. They didn't have men in the tribe. They were only women. And they had to go to Moshe for a special thing to see, do we get a plot of land or we don't? We're the only ones from Shev Menashe. We'll, we'll visit that when we, when we reach the Parajah. So basically, he's saying now he wants to set up camp. He associates himself with Shev and Dan. And they tell him, no, you can't come with us. As soon as they tell him that you can't come with us, he raises his voice, starts to yell and scream and curse, using the Shem HaMeforash, Hashem's full name, secret name that people don't know, that we don't know nowadays, and that he heard during the time of Sinai, he heard that name and he cursed that name. What a brazen attitude. To, who could do that even? What kind of a, a person can do that? But this particular guy did it, and basically he was quarantined, he was handed over to Moshe, and the judgment was that he needs to get stoned, they stoned him and they killed him. Okay, that's the story at face value. Let's get some background to it. How did this guy become a half Egyptian, half Jew? So back in Egypt, when the Jewish people were slaves, they had Shotrim and Nuxim. Shotrim were police officers. Nuxim were the ones that were on top of him. Welcome, Rabbi. The Shotrim, the two famous Shotrim that we know, are, are Datan and Aviram. Datan and Aviram were Jews themselves. But it was their job to keep all the Jewish slaves in check. Making sure that they fill their quota, making sure that they're going to get the, the job done, that they're showing up on time, not leaving early. You know, they were like on top of them. And on top of them were the Noxim, were Egyptians, that would give them a hard time should things get lax. <coughs> one morning, I mean, I'm sorry, one day, one of these Egyptian Noxim saw Datan's wife, and she was beautiful. And he coveted her. So the next day, he came to Datan. He woke him up really, really early and told him, Oh, we got a lot of work today. Come with me. You got to leave now. And he sent him away. And when he sent him away, he went into Datan's tent or house or hut, whatever they uh, had it back in uh, Egypt. And he slept with his wife. And from that union came out this half Jew half Egyptian. They say that the woman's name was Shulamit from the Shevet Adan. Why was her name Shulamit? Because she would stand outside of the tent and always say, Shalom, Shalom. She would say hello to everybody. She was very talkative, not a good trait. By the way, out of all the Jewish women in Egypt, she was the only one that this happened to. This is, was not a common thing. It happened one time. And this is the story, and they're mentioning it. So, the mitzir, this, this offspring of that union comes now and curses Hashem and gets stoned. And we're trying to think, what's behind this? If this is Torah Kohanim, if this is the book of the Kohanim, what does this story have to do with what's going on over here? It's completely out of, uh, out of place. It has nothing to do from what's before it or after it. Well, there's a few explanations, but typically, if you look at it at face value, it's not connected to the holidays. It's not connected to who, uh, what a Kohen, who a Kohen can marry or not. It's not connected to the job of a Kohen. What is the story doing at the end of the parasha? So this is something interesting that I, heard, uh, that I read this morning from the book Ma'ayana Shavua. It's a book that uh, has Midrashim from many different rabbis. And one of the Midrashim said that basically what was happening over here, Shevet Dan said, we don't want this neighbor. We don't want this guy next to us. This guy is bad news. 
In other words, they were protecting their environment for themselves, for children, and for the Am Yisrael. They knew he was bad news. His actions proved that he was bad news. I mean, who is so brazen, has the, the audacity to curse out Hashem? You were part of Yetziat Mitzvah. You saw the miracles. You're going to curse Hashem? Now, the desert is so big. There's so much room. Couldn't they have given him a spot? Couldn't they have found out a solution for him? The problem is, he failed again. Whenever there's a situation, the first thing that you do, the first thing that you do is you ask a rabbi, what's the right thing to do? He could have went to Moshe, he says, Moshe, I'm in a situation. I'm half Jew, I'm half Egyptian, my mom is from Shevedan, technically I'm a Jew. What do I do? Where do I stay? Where's my hete? Where's my, where's my place in the Jewish nation? He didn't do that. He just came, he says, I'm staying here. They didn't accept him, he cursed out God. So he didn't consult a rabbi. That's the first mistake. Second mistake, he went as much as to curse out the Creator. Unbelievable mistake. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no coming back from that. Third mistake is he came in trying to corrupt the environment. You see, he was more of an Egyptian than a Jew. He was more, he had more characteristics, character traits of his father than of his mother. And we learned from here, from the from the half Jew, half Egyptian that came into the camp and acted this way is that we have to protect our surroundings. We have to copy what Shevet Dan did. We do have to watch out who's going to be our neighbor. We do have to watch out who's next to us, who our kids are going to see, learn from, talk to, because we are a product of our environments. You better believe that whoever you're next to all day, every day, is who you're going to copy and emulate. It's very, very important that, they, that a Jew be in the proper environment. That's why we're so particular about where our kids go to school, where we live, where we eat. We're always like, you know, like if it's a Jewish neighborhood, it's a Jewish neighborhood for a reason, because we want to be in that environment. You don't see us dispersed throughout different communities, living as loners. It's all about protecting it so the kids, so we are an environment of Torah, mitzvot, ma'asim tovim. That's what we want to be. We want to be in that there's communities that took it to the next level. If you ever heard about Lakewood Yeshiva, they bought Yerushalayim number two. And you go over there and it's 100% Jewish life. Sniut, learning, way of thought, chesed. I mean, the thing that I... They have things, like for example, obviously there's a lot of children being born throughout the year. They can, there's homes that outside of their homes there's bags. They know that there's a certain address, that in one house there's a bag that has just baby bottles. Take as much as you want. There's a house that has baby clothes. Take as much as you want. Gmach, minut chasadim. It's a community that takes care of itself. A community that makes sure that everything is Torah-based. They're protecting their environment. Us, it's a little bit more difficult. Especially people that live in Miami, or even more so Miami Beach, wherever you are. It's all around us. Protecting the environment and where you live and who you associate with is very important for your spirituality. If you're connected to your neshama, if you want to protect your neshama, you have to make sure that you're feeding your neshama its proper sustenance. Your neshama's food is Torah mitzvot ma'asim tovim. Anything that's far, that's outside of it, damages the neshama. The people of Shevet Dan saw, that's a bad neighbor. Let's not let him in. Why? Because we might jeopardize the outcome or, uh, of our children or of our tribe. So, we saw the beautiful story of the Kohen and his amazing trip of Abu Dhat Hashem and Emunah that he stuck to the Halakha no matter what it meant to him personally in his life. Even though that normally a person's emotions would outpower in that type of situation their religious life. But Baruch Hashem had a strong neshama. And then we see here in Shevet Dan that they were also very connected to their neshama. And that they were also very connected to protecting the neshama and their surroundings. And they drew the line and said, no. Your father is not Jewish. You don't have the right to be over here. You don't have the right to come here and corrupt us. And to remember, had he gone to Moshe Rabbeinu to get some advice, maybe there would have been a different outcome. It's always good to go to a rabbi and find out what's the right thing to do and not to decide for yourself.
Let the Shem Yom have a great rest of the weekend. Shabbat Shalom.